Sea urchins, oh. Kelp forest. Wake up, wake up. Hello, my you scientist friends. I was taking my midday nap with our sea otter here. Didn't realize it was one o'clock already. Time for our class today. Are you ready to learn with me? Great. Let's set our friend down real quick. Oh. <sighs> well, I am refreshed. Are you all ready to learn at home, scientists? We are going to have some fun talking about sea otters, kelp forests, conservation. Well, before we get started, we should tell you how you can participate. Today, you can text us questions at 562-286-1838. Jen's on question control over on the other side, so she'll be able to help write those questions down, bring them into the studio so that we can answer them for you. And my friend Kaya is back behind the scenes helping control all the fun stuff back here. So what's back here though? Wow. What observations can we make, youth scientists? Because we're all scientists, we have to make observations and we ask questions from those and we're gonna learn from those observations. You can text those things that you think about, you have questions or you see to Jen and she'll help share some of that with us. Well, what is this stuff? The kelp. A kelp forest. If you live here in California, you've probably seen kelp. Kelp does exist in a lot of parts of the world, but only very specific, special places. There's five main zones where there's cold enough water, a lot of nutrients, enough sunlight, and the right conditions to get it to grow. So it has to be colder water. We have to have nutrients coming up from the deep ocean, and there has to be enough sunlight for them to grow. So those are the three main things that make a kelp forest a kelp forest, right? Plus having kelp in it. Well, we can see from this, the sun is shining through the kelp. It does really look like a forest that we're exploring while we're underwater. And there's a lot of living things that rely on the kelp forest habitat, including lots of species of fish. This is our blue cavern kelp forest habitat. Now, this is not quite like the last one we looked at. This is all replica kelp. So if we tried to put real kelp in, remember that last image? It'd be really tough to see all the cool fish in there. Kelp also grows incredibly fast. In the right conditions, kelp can grow two to three feet per day. So like this much to this much per day, every day. Now kelp will normally live maybe 100 to 150 feet deep, maybe 200 if the water's really clear. If the water's not clear, that's actually kind of good because it means there's a lot of nutrients. So it'll anchor to the floor, start growing up towards the sunlight. And when they get to the top, it kind of hangs over and creates this canopy effect like we saw in the last one. Now the animals that live here include sharks like the leopard shark, all these different species of fish, giant sea bass, but most importantly that we want to talk about today, sea otters. What do you love about sea otters? Just like this one. They could be even have a conversation. Hello. But what do we know about sea otters? What have you heard before? Or maybe what are you curious to learn more about? Let's see what we can come up with about sea otters. They're mammals. Hmm. They, oh, I see whiskers on this one. So they do have hair like mammals should. They breathe air like we do. Now, the cool thing about this picture is that you can even see their teeth right there. Well, we're going to take a look at a replica otter skull in a little bit, so we can take a little bit closer look at their teeth. We already have a question coming in. What's my favorite kelp forest animal? Sea otters are one of them. I actually have a lot of favorites. It's hard to have just one favorite, right? It, it's tough. But one of my favorite things are the otters, but also I love all the little things that crawl around on the ground. And a lot of them, they actually, the sea otter likes to eat. So when we're talking about teeth, what do sea otters want to eat? Hmm. Maybe it would help if we go take a look at the teeth first, right? So let's figure out what kind of things an animal with a mouth like that would want to eat. Remember, if you watched any of our programs about sharks before, sharks have specific teeth for eating specific things. If you were watching Tuesday when they were talking about whales, Whales may or may not have teeth. It depends on the kind of whale, and that determines what they eat. So what's going on inside your mouth really helps us figure out what you can eat based on how you're going to eat it. 
So let's go over to our camera over on the side here. I have a special camera. I got to turn it on. I forgot to do that before class. And let's find out what a sea otter might want to eat. Now, here's our replica skull. We're going to change the lighting a little bit. And I'm going to just going to look at the lower jaw. But let's zoom in, because if we're too far away, we can't see all the details, right? Let's take a look. What do you recognize about these teeth? Do any of them look familiar to you? Hmm. Well, here's the other half of the jaw and the skull. It's the size of my hand. Now, this could be from 50, 60 pound sea otter, but their head is pretty small. But their teeth are pretty significant. They kind of look like our teeth, don't they? And you use your tongue. That's how I touch your teeth. You could use your finger, but then you got to wipe your hands off. And make sure your hands are clean before you do that, right? Because you don't want to put gross stuff in your mouth. So you use your tongue. What kind of shapes, what kind of textures can you tell from our teeth? Now, a couple of our viewers that were watching earlier today, Valeria and uh, Hydro, are asking, how many hairs do otters have? That's going to be the next step of looking at otters and how they survive their habitat. So keep that in mind. We're going to come back. That is a very good question to ask. So these teeth are flat in the back and pointy up front. It's like our teeth. We have flat teeth in the back for crunching and munching. We have pointy teeth up front to take bites and tear our food away. So do you think sea otters are eating the same stuff we do? Like pizza or salads. Kai is saying sea otters love to eat pizza. Maybe if it was a seafood pizza. I don't really like seafood pizza. I like classic kinds of seafood pizza. But what, what does an otter eat from the ocean? Because they're not eating the same foods as us, even though they have very similar teeth. Jen said hot dogs. She's voting hot dogs. Ah, so this is the, somebody else asked this question. It leads right into what we want to talk about. Think of things that live on the floor in the ocean that an otter could dive down and get. They're not chasing the fish. That takes a lot of energy. And otters aren't the fastest swimmers. They like to be the otter that goes around shopping like, ooh, I want one of those. I want one of those. I'm going to take one of those. And they can just grab their food from the sea floor. Things like, uh, oh, there's my urchin test. Sea urchin. This looks very different from an urchin we might see in the ocean. We're thinking of something more like that, right? Well, this is that minus the spines. Urchins have spines for protection and a shell for protection. So somebody asked, how do they eat urchins without getting hurt? Would you want to just start biting onto this? Ah, I don't think you'd want to bite into a pincushion. That's not going to be that good for you. So what urchins can do is I'm going to use my sea urchin or my sea otter model to eat my sea urchin friend. They have to come up to the water surface, lay on their back, and they'll pull the spines off. So it's in there, pulling the spines off, and then they'll take their favorite rock or shell from their armpit. That's not where you store your favorite rocks from. Well, I'm not going to show you where my favorite rock. No. So they have more skin under their armpits so they can hide things. Like, I'll hide my phone there every once in a while. I don't need a free hand. But they can store rocks in there the whole day. And they'll take it out, and they'll crack open the shell, and then they can eat the food. So they're very smart about how they get into their food. They'll also eat things like crabs, lobsters, sea stars. Well, they eat lots of things that are hard to get off the sea floor, but they're very strong, and they're very smart. Our sea otters here are kind of mischievous, and they will take things apart we didn't realize you could take apart as a sea otter. That's kind of interesting. We even have to be careful when our staff are diving in the exhibit to clean the water, because if the otters are next to them, they might play with the dive tank. We don't want that to happen. So they will use their paws to help grab and hold onto their food. Now, they don't have opposable thumbs like we do, but they do have paws, and somehow they can unscrew nuts and bolts without having thumbs or wrenches. They're pretty smart, like I said. And they'll grab their food, they'll munch on it, just like we would eat. But they're eating very specific seafood items. Now, I think we have a little bit of a video of them eating. So let's take a look at one of our sea otters eating. I'm going to step out of frame so we can watch all the cuteness and in all its glory. 
Do you notice what this one's eating? Om nom 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 nom. Oh, those are shrimp. You can actually see the little shrimp shell right there. See, they don't need thumbs to hold it like we do. Two hands, always two hands. And they will be able to pull shells off. They can break shells open. They can get through muscle and clam shells even. And this is okay for them. They are normally adapted for this. Now, the cool thing is the shells that they are eating are kind of like when we eat salad. It helps our digestion, helps things move correctly through our system. So we leave the, the shells on the shrimp for them because they do need to eat that. All the other things here at the Aquarium of the Pacific that might eat shrimp, we give them shelled shrimp. So there's no shells to worry about. But did you notice that that shrimp piece was not the same color as shrimp that we might order from a restaurant? They eat all their food raw. So even though they're here with us, they have to eat the food exactly like they might see out in the ocean, minus a few shells here and there. So we don't give them clams or urchins with the shell on, because remember I said they're mischievous? If they had a rock or a shell piece that they were able to start scraping the windows up, we wouldn't want that to happen, because then you couldn't see inside to see how they're doing. So we give them clam pieces. We give them the shrimp with shells on, because that shell's not tough enough to do anything to our windows. We'll also give them squid every once in a while. So squid helps with some of the water content that they need to ingest. But in general, they're not eating as many varieties of items as they might out in the ocean. Well, one of the other adaptations they have to survive is that they learn from their mom how to hunt. So this sea otter might only know how to hunt a certain range of food, like maybe this one likes to eat sea stars and urchins and maybe clams, and that's all it knows how to hunt. They learn from mom exactly what to hunt. It's called a mature line. It's a maternal path of who learns what to eat. Now this one's got a crab. They'll even eat crabs and stuff off the seafloor, stuff that you might be a little nervous about picking up and looking at. But the otters are pretty good about grabbing them and hunting, pulling them up to the surface and eating their food. Now, one of the other adaptations we should mention is that they can survive in some pretty cold water. Remember, they have hair like we do, but it's much more intense. Their bodies don't have a whole lot of body fat to stay warm. So instead, there's these two things that they do to stay warm. Eat a lot and be furry. That's it. Well, how does that work? Because that's a very simple answer to how do they stay warm. So let's talk about what's going on on the body. So this is a younger sea otter, you can tell, because it has all brown fur on its cap, on its head, instead of silvery fur going down through its shoulders. So once they reach adulthood and they're mature, more mature, they will turn more silvery. Now, let's get back to Valeria and Hiro's question of how many hairs do they have? Well, honestly, then it's a lot. But how do we figure that out? So I have a sample of otter fur. Now, this is not from ours. We have samples of otter fur from the Department of Wildlife Fish and Game that we get to use to teach with and educate our friends at home about otter fur. This is pretty dense fur. You want to try and look at it under the camera with me? It's not going to be the easiest to look at because it's really dense. Let's just find out how dense this fur is. Now we're still zoomed in. There's my finger. Woo, we can't focus on my finger. Oh, there we go. I'm gonna turn the lights way down. Now I'm gonna try and pull the fur apart a little bit so that we can try and look and see if we can find where the skin might be. That, I mean, it's not easy to find in there, is it? Let's get a little more light on it and see if that helps. Hmm. It's really, really dense. So this fur it actually might help if we look at the side of the fur, like a cross section. Let's turn the lights back up on our little fur sample. Now, when we look at this and we zoom way in, we can see that these are really, really tiny hairs, but there's a lot of those hairs. They have so many hairs, in fact, that in about a square inch of space, you could count up to 1 million hairs per inch. That is impressive. That is a ton of hair. All right, let's go back to the studio because otherwise it's just a dark screen of fur. Fur. They're very furry. So if you wanted to think about how that equals people, you'd have to have you and maybe nine of your friends 
all shave your head. Don't do that at home. It actually makes a big mess. Shave all of your hair off and scrunch all 10 of your hair down into one square inch of space. That's the equivalent of a sea otter. Or imagine one big dog, all their fur scrunched down to one square inch. So that number of hairs is the same. But remember, hair can be different thicknesses. Like my cat's hair has a different thickness than my hair or a dog's hair has different thickness than my hair. So their hairs are very fine, but very high number of them. And because of that really thick fur coat, that keeps them warm. Now let's go back to the food part. They eat a ton of food. And in fact, they'll eat more than I think any of you could ever try. They'll eat up to a third of their body weight in one day per day. Could you imagine eating a third of your body weight? Now people might eat up to 5% of our body weight, not 30% of our body weight. That's a big difference for them. But because it's colder, they're burning more calories. Their body is releasing a lot of body heat to stay warm. So they are burning tons of calories to stay warm. And that's normal for them. Now, if it's a warmer climate, they may not need to eat as much. So let's think of southern sea otters like this one is that live here in California versus the northern sea otters, the ones that live in Alaska. Pretty big difference in temperature. So maybe the Alaskan otters have a bigger diet. They have a bigger body too, which actually helps with staying warm. So think of different shaped objects. Let's say we had a tennis ball and a softball. I don't have them. I use their imaginations. We're scientists. We can use our imagination. Tennis ball and softball. Well, there's a thing called a surface volume to uh, surface area to volume ratio. And the smaller the object is, the easier it is for temperature to change on it. So even if it was the same material, but it's bigger around, it's going to hold more body heat easier. So a bigger otter of the same kind of otter will probably stay warmer in the same temperature of water just because it's a little bit bigger. So there's a lot of science going into how otters stay warm. It's not just fur. It's not just they eat a lot. There's a big explanation behind a lot of this. And now we have some cool questions that came in. Have our sea otters ever painted pictures for us? Well, some of our animals do paint pictures. Now, remember, I said otters are mischievous, so they might steal your paint and then not show you what they made, which if you're going to make beautiful art, why not show the rest of us what it looks like? So I don't know if they ever do that. Uh, and let's get Ella's question. Do sea otters make sounds to communicate? You want to hear my impersonation of a sea otter? Jen's excited because she's heard it before. You ready? Ah! Was that the sound you were expecting from one of these animals? No, it was not. They almost sound like cats screaming. Literally, that's what they sound like. And it seems weird that such a voracious animal that's a huge diet that has big pointy teeth makes ah! noises. But, you know, it's a sea otter. Even though they're part of the badger wolverine family, they make scary noises, but they are pretty scary. So, whatever. Now, uh, ooh, great question from Natalie. Why do sea otters eat on their backs? All right, let's get our sea otter friend back up here. Just like this one. <sighs> Eating and sleeping on our back in the water. Think of their bodies. They have pretty elongate bodies, right? They'll tuck their tail up and around. There's the one eating with the crab. If you have to crack open things and eat them a little bit at a time, wouldn't you want a table to eat from? What if your table is you, yourself? Works pretty nicely. Now, because of the way that this kind of mammal eats, some mammals can swallow their food underwater. This kind of mammal really needs to eat at the surface, laying on its back so it can crack open the shells of those things it was eating. So great question, Natalie, about how and why this works. So if you were an animal that could eat underwater, imagine you had to crack it open while holding your breath and then swallow it without also breathing. That's a pretty tough challenge to ask for a sea otter. So they have to eat at the surface so that they can spend enough energy and time cracking open some of the shells and getting that food in their, melt, in their mouth and be able to swallow it. Uh, all right, another question. I think I got all those from Madeline and Vivian. How do they sleep? Just like we do. They do sleep, they do rest for long periods of time. I don't know if they dream like we do, but that's a possibility. We're finding out so many cool things about animals as we learn more as scientists would. But think about, do they eat underwater? No. Should they sleep underwater? Not if you want to be able to breathe, right? 
they're not like dolphins and whales that can be mostly submerged, they're going to be sleeping on their backs, just like we saw them eating, or actually in our exhibit, they will haul out onto the rock work and they'll sleep on that too. But not just anywhere. They have the best kind of bedding. You probably want this if it's the middle of August or September and you don't have air conditioning. They sleep on a bed of ice. Yes. We'll put in a bunch of crushed ice into the exhibit just like this. They love to play in it. We'll put some food in there. They roll around. Actually, they sometimes eat the ice too. I mean, being a sea otter at an aquarium looks pretty awesome. You get fed all the time. You get the best toys to play with. You have so much fun interacting with other in sea otters. They're just so cute. Oh, uh, Kai said she has them playing with a ball. Now, it seems like uh, playtime, that just seems like silly. Why do we want playtime? Actually, it's not just playtime for playtime. It's playtime with a purpose. This is called enrichment. So when we give them things to do, to play with, or to get food out of, it helps keep their minds active. Remember, they can cause trouble if they're too bored, just like you know any of us can. So if we give them things to work on and do, they're a little less inclined to misbehave every once in a while. Do you see them banging that toy against the window? They've learned if you put food in some of these toys and they bang it against the window, the food will pop out. So they've learned how to get the food out of some of these things. The other cool thing is we'll put toys in there that are heavy. They can, we can hide food in them. They're heavy and we just throw them into the water. It'll sink and they have to go do the same behavior to retrieve that toy to get the food as they would if they were out in the ocean. So they'd have to go find their food, grab it off the seafloor, pull it back up to the surface and eat. So we give them some behaviors to do that are exactly what they would have to experience out in the ocean. But all of this that we've been talking about so far is kind of fun to talk about otters, but let's talk about also the importance of sea otters. Uh, oh, great question was how do they float while eating? Well, just like any of us would float, I'm assuming their bodies are not dense enough to really sink unless they want it to. They have to swim down to get their food, but I don't think their bodies are so dense they just sink like a rock. They have to be able to float to eat, to sleep. So if their bodies adapted be, to be too heavy and they'd sink during this time period, that's a what we call negative or bad adaptation. And there are such things as bad adaptations. In nature, sometimes an, an ability comes about, but it does not help you survive longer or better. And eventually that adaptation is no longer in the population because those animals have not survived as long or as often enough to have more babies. The adaptations that are good for a thing to survive, they tend to be more frequent and they happen more often because they can live longer and have potentially more babies over many generations. So if they had bad adaptations like sinking too much, probably wouldn't be good for otter populations. So the ones that could float tended to have more babies more often. And because of that, the otters we see now can do this really cool abilities that nature helps them come up with. So that's why they need to float. But let's talk more about the conservation aspects, the importance of keeping sea otters in our habitat. So, the sad thing is, about early 1900s, before, I think, 1911, sea otters were almost extinct. That fur that we took a look at, that's kind of fun to talk about, it is very warm. It keeps people warm, too. Now, if just a few people had hunt sea otters, they would not have gone extinct. But because it came so popular to get otter fur, the animal hunters at that time and trappers, they would hunt too many otters. And so everybody was using otter fur for themselves instead of the otters. When they did a census, they could only find maybe 50 otters in, I think, all of California. So at that point, it's like, well, there's just not enough left. What do we do? They made it illegal to hunt and trade otter fur. And then I think that was back about 1911. That's called the Fur Treaties Act. And it was an agreement between different groups and nations to say, hey, you know what? We need to stop hunting otters. We need them in the environment. We might as well stop doing this. There's other things we can do. Cool. They stopped doing that. Well, then we had other things happen. In 1972, we had the Marine Mammal Protection Act, meaning we can't even go near a sea otter. If you wanted to walk up and touch a sea otter, one, they're not as nice as you think. They're actually pretty ornery and mean. Don't do that. But also, it's illegal. You're not supposed to just go up and touch a sea otter or a seal or a sea lion. You have to stay at least 50 feet away. So we can't even 
hunt, we can't interact with, we can't harass or irritate the marine mammals of any kind of marine mammal. Otters, seals, sea lions, horse, uh, not sea horses, they're not a mammal, uh, whales. So all of these different mammals in the ocean, we have to let them just be mammals in the ocean. Cool. We also have the Endangered Species Act. Well, now that's three big things going on that protect endangered animals. Well, sea otters have been able to repopulate quite well, but not as good as we would like. There's about 3,000 along the California coastline. So from 50 to almost 3,000 in about 110 years, that's pretty good improvement. But we're still at a fraction of where the population of sea otters used to be. They're not even re-inhabiting uh, re the entire range that they used to. So right now, if you were to visit California, or if you live here, and you wanted to understand where sea otters are, imagine the California coastline. Whoops, swoops down like this, right? I'm doing it backwards because from your view, you're looking at the map, right? There's this part on the bottom of California where the coastline suddenly goes from a northwest pattern to a east-west pattern. It's called Point Conception. From that point north, we might see sea otters, but not anywhere south. Or not very, very often. There's been a few times we've seen sea otters down by Long Beach, but they used to be here more often, but they're not right now. They've even tried to repopulate sea otters on Catalina Island. They brought otters from Monterey to Catalina, I think, or near Monterey. It was not near here, it was north. They brought them to Catalina, and it's like, yes, we were able to relocate sea otters. They're going to have babies here. They're going to have new sea otters in Southern California. These sea otters said, no. And they swam back north. Because they're like, but I don't want to live in Southern California. They had a home range that they wanted. And that was a kind of an important discovery on scientists' part to say, maybe it won't work to move animals to new population, population spots to get their numbers up. You won't know unless you try. But, you know, the sea otters did swim back north and they're doing fine. They, didn't, they don't want to be down here, but they're doing fine up there. Another cool question of how otters, how are otters able to hold the rocks on them, remember they have armpit pockets, just like I have pockets on my vest. They have pockets where it's a deep section of their armpit. They can just kind of hold the food in. Because when they swim, if you've ever seen them swim, I don't even know if we have a video of them swimming. We're, Kai's gonna look, but if you watch otters, they're not doing this. That's how we swim. Otters are mostly using these big back feet. Their back feet are actually more like paddles to push with and the front ones kind of help just grab stuff. They even use their big tail to help steer and move around. All right, so let's take a look at what's going on here. Well, there they are. Do you see those front paws moving around? Not so much. Let's look at the next one. All right, are you going to use your front paws? No. Well, where'd it go? It must have dove in the water. Oh, there. Nope, that's fish. Oh, there it is. They use these big back feet to help push them around, and they're more like paddles that help them push in the water. So that's a really good way to watch what otters do. So they have all these crazy, amazing, fun abilities. It seems crazy because it's different than what we expect, but they actually are very successful at being oceanic animals. There's other kinds of otters in the world, and a lot of them need help too. So we've been able to protect sea otters, but there's such things as river otters, marine otters, and a few others, I'm assuming. Those are the two other main groups I know of. The marine otter, as far as I know, only lives in South America. But then there's other river otters all over North America. So we need to make sure that we're protecting our waterways too. Not just not taking them from their habitat, but protecting where they live. That way, if we make sure that their habitats are safe for them to live in, there's more opportunity for them to have babies and keep generations of otters growing. So there's a lot of things that anybody can do to help. One is reduce and reuse, make sure we're putting our trash where it's supposed to go, not letting it get out into the habitat, but also things that run down to rivers and oceans and waterways. Don't let those pollutants get out there because that could be damaging those animals that live in the river and then in the ocean because rivers lead to oceans. So if we protect our habitats, we let the animals be animals and we just make sure that we leave them alone sometimes, the animals are going to do pretty well on their own. All right. Well, I think we're out of questions. Great. I was making sure Jen wasn't writing anything more down. One more thing. One more thing. So. Oh. 
good point, Valeria. When sea otters weren't there, the whole ecosystem wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. So we call that a keystone species. They're the most important thing to be present in that habitat. So remember, they eat urchins. Urchins love eating seaweed. So if there's no otters, there's going to be too many urchins. And it creates what's called an urchin barren because they eat all the seaweed off the floor and it floats away. And instead of having that beautiful video that we started the program with, there's just water. And the kelp is really important to be a home for everybody else that lives in the kelp forest. So if there's not enough otters, we're actually going to have a pretty unhealthy kelp forest habitat. It may not even be a kelp forest at some point. So it's important to make sure that the ecosystem is in balance and everybody that's supposed to be there is. And we can do our part to help make sure that they are healthy in that space. Great questions from everybody today from our youth scientist group. We're going to have a whole lot more fun the rest of this week. And next week, we have more opportunities for you to ask us questions, learn so much from us. What's our topic for tomorrow? Let me find out real quick. I did not read that before I started class. Tomorrow <gasps> is going to be one of my favorite classes we do. It's the squid dissection. So if you want to tune in tomorrow, you scientists, to learn more about our aquatic friends, we're going to be doing a squid dissection. So from all of us at the Aquarium Island Academy and Summer Kids Club, have some fun. Have some fun learning, and we'll see you tomorrow.